I thought uh, of talking about this large uh, subject and in fact that subject suggestion came from Professor uh, Satyamurthy. That subject, uh, I don't know to what extent I can uh, give justice to that, but nevertheless let me give you a few pointers. I have given an elaborate um, uh, abstract. I will not get into all of those uh, in this brief presentation. Water is uh, both a molecule and a large, well, and it's also the oceans. Okay, this image is light, um, but of course, what I wanted to say was that water is a molecule and the large ocean. Now, if you look at water from a distance, this distance is about uh, 2.6 billion kilometers away. This was, this picture was taken by Voyager on February 14th, 1990. When Voyager was sent, well, it was sent to look at the solar system and it just passed the solar system looking at the whole solar system from Uranus and this is that picture. And that obviously is Earth and that is this pale blue dot. Water is all that this planet has. And obviously everything is related to water and therefore it is uh, natural that when we start looking at uh, sustainability, so all of those are essentially you can see one way or the other water in this, whether it is zero hunger or life under the oceans, on the land or equality and all gender equality and many others, you see water in one way or the other. And if you look at India per se, India has so much of water, about uh, 1500 cubic meters of water per capita. But then every technology that we have, every system that we have, we should be talking about how that water can benefit everyone. How can that reach all? Principal problem that I have seen is that if water has to be for, for all, we need to be sensitive to these three words, store, sensitive, and smart. Although we have this large rainfall, 85th in a list of these many countries, we don't store water at all. We just store 8% of our water. Uh, even with so much of uh, knowledge, traditional knowledge on storage and conservation, we just do this. And water is for all, for every living form. But what we have done, this is not Indian data, 83% of freshwater species have declined globally in the past 50 years. Now, when we look at all of these, so obviously one has to store, one has to be sensitive to all of these facts that water is for all and one is connecting this to one health. Now, if you are developing, and development means using water in a big way, can GDP grow even by capping freshwater withdrawals? Now, world has shown a way. Here is uh, the US data, and if you look at the GDP growth, even if you cap freshwater withdrawals that US capped somewhere around 1975 or so, that is the freshwater withdrawals, it is capped, but GDP is growing. That obviously means lots of new technologies, they have not come into India in a big way. So what I wanted to say was that in energy, food, clothing, construction, manufacturing, everything else that is connected with water, you need very many new technologies. And in the next few slides, I will show you some numbers. Water is big in every scale and in opportunities, wealth, as well as for me, it is in satisfaction. 
look at this number. The total water infrastructure value for a connected global population of 9 billion people estimated somewhere around here, that amounts to $60 trillion. And if this resource is not available, obviously we don't have such a connected, well, water infrastructure. And this paper estimates that 36% of African population and 44% of the Asian population will be connected to a sewer network, will be connected to a sewer network by 2050, and rest of them, rest of the population will not have it. So if you look at this, this kind of numbers, you see whether we have that money at all. Look at the total wealth of India, somewhere around 13 trillion, 14, 15, there are various estimates. It is just that. Obviously, this is not going to be available. Coupled with this, there are numerous challenges. We study several rivers in our country, and we find, and this is, everyone knows that every river is contaminated. And in one river that we study, or some of our friends study, 50% of the microbial diversity is lost forever. And if we start looking at solutions for India, we need solutions for all of these. And all of these solutions have to work either this temperature and relative humidity or this temperature and relative humidity extremes are too much uh, in our country. No. With all that, do we have technologies? Yes, we have technologies, whether it is membrane distillation or capacity deionization or atmospheric water harvesting or water recycling or rainwater harvesting, wastewater based epidemiology, many, many others to clean up our lakes or rivers or whatever. We have, I mean, I'm not talking about India alone globally, we have technologies, all of them can even work on photovoltaics, which we have in abundance. So, what did we do? Uh, let me take a few examples from my own science to illustrate that how much more is left to be done. Our science showed that it is possible to remove contaminants from water affordably. And this is a filter that works in West Bengal with an input of about 60 parts per billion arsenic with no additional pressure drop. This water that comes out with just about two seconds of contact time is less than two parts per billion arsenic. Great material and it can work in the field every day supplying 1000 liters of water for three years with very small quantity of material and science behind this is what is called uh, water positive materials using biopolymers. Now, this is essentially to say that on biopolymers you can crystallize nanomaterials and create structures uh, which are complex but they are stable. This whole synthesis can be done at room temperature without uh, organic solvents and all that, several such materials have been made. Now, if you take such materials and put it in a small cartridge and pass these contaminants at really high concentrations that is typically present in our contaminated soils or water, you get output like this. So that means that you have extremely efficient materials that obviously can be tested in the field and we chose this particular district, uh, one district called uh, Murshidabad here, and in Murshidabad, that is the district uh, expanded map, 100 places, we implemented this technology. Great. So we can replace all these existing plants with plants of this kind, supplying about 200,000 liters of water per day. Similar water can be supplied. Contaminant levels are something like this, and this is what you get at the output. And this is now going very well. Now at cost like 2.1 paisa per liter. What I wanted to show you is that we've just touched that tip of that iceberg. So there are 
300 million people affected with all these contaminants uh, in our country. And we have just given water to about 2 million people with such technologies. Now today, all of these water quality and quantity can all be mapped uh, with, with sensors and you can create materials, they adsorb these contaminants, the waste can be managed very well, so, so governments are ready to take this. I'll show you a short movie where this is going to. So this is a community and water is being supplied from this particular plant. There are now over 1,500 plants of this kind in the country. Uh, and these plants are, quality and quantity are being monitored today. And this is being done in really remote situations where power is not reliable, network is not reliable, but it is possible to monitor this. So, you can have this kind of such plants across and this is possible also because of sensors and I was taking uh, a, well I conducting a study of what that va that's value of that sensor market is if you were to monitor all the water treatment plants all the taps well one tap for home and all the water treatment plants sewage treatment plants the number comes to something as large as this. And this is today possible. But what is in store or what is coming are sensors of this kind. So these are spectroscopy or spectrometers as tiny as four millimeters in thickness. They are currently available and the world is working towards making this two millimeter thin and that means those spectrometers will be available on the mobile phone and it is possible to measure water quality. And India is measuring water quality from the top to down south and we are monitoring 13 villages in this particular place and data are being collected every minute. So what that leads to is a hydroinformatics platform and this, many people think that water is becoming data. And associated opportunities because it is possible to predict almost everything related to, well, routine aspects of health with water. And that is also taking us to Water 4.0, a digital twin of water resources, which we today do with it in a few villages with the physical infrastructure being mapped digitally. But if you want to contaminate or if you are contaminating these waters, uh, rivers and lakes and all that and purifying that later on, aren't there additional other approaches? Aren't there better approaches? So when I talk to people, I see that there is a lot of traditional knowledge which we have lost in the recent just about 40, 50 years. We had all these cotton in our country. Instead of using these, we have thrown away all of these and we have come to white cotton and we are now coloring this and contaminating the uh, rivers. Now, of course, there are other, uh, other similar kind of uh, products uh, which we can look at. Always may not be, everything may not be scalable, but some are. For example, arsenic free rice. So there is a lot of knowledge in our country, 
where this person's name is Debel Dev. He grows rice, and many of these rice varieties reject arsenic, although they are grown in arsenic-rich soil. Uh, and some of them enrich uh, iron, some of them enrich zinc, and many others. There's a whole lot of traditional knowledge uh, in this area, and we have lost. I was just touching upon some of those things that we have lost uh, in, our, in our growth. For all of this to happen, we need to have a better policy. Uh, and we have written about this. But let me stop this, or let me come to this conclusion of this lecture by sharing with you a dream. Well, our dreams, all of our dreams, uh, come to reality with materials. When Jules Verne wrote this book, this novel, From the Earth to the Moon, Jules Verne was talking about sending man to moon, obviously with a vessel. That vessel he suggested to be made of aluminum. This was 1865. Aluminum was industrially produced only in 17, 1879. So even before its commercial production, he chose aluminum and obviously for anything that I am speaking to you, we have to look at new materials, which may not have been made. For example, if I take this stream of water going into H2, and it produces water again in that process producing energy, and of course producing pure water, we would solve both energy and clean water crisis together, but can this be affordable? Can this be inclusive? Can this be sustainable? Which would require new materials. But look at just the numbers. Hydrogen plus oxygen is about 286,000 joules. And one kilogram of solar hydrogen, some of our people say, is somewhere around 750 rupees, but it could be 150 rupees soon. This can make 143 million joules of energy. Desalination, the best of technologies that we are running here in India, they are 2.4 kilowatt hour for, or 8.84 million joules for one cubic meter of water. So obviously you can calculate all that and say that you can get water desalination at 0.9 paisa per liter using solar hydrogen. Obviously, we need to add energy and other costs and plant and transportation. So this is possible with new materials and new kind of technologies. And this kind of suggestions can be made about all aspects surrounding water. And that would mean water literacy. To give you an example, if you were to think about that water literacy, Italy cannot be sold at five rupees a piece because there is so much of water in it. And clothing cannot be that way. We have to have a national detergent policy based on how much water it contaminates. All that, thank you very much. Education to seek, uh, on your first slide I think, you said that the per capita demand for water is uh, 1,500 cubic meters. Uh, this is what, per lifetime? Per month? No, no, or water availability it is. Oh, that's water availability. Yeah. Yeah, but even so, this is during this period of time. No, this is for the whole year, per capita, per year. Per this year. Per, this okay. is for per year. per year. And if you look at water consumption, materials, products, and all that, India per person, we consume about 1,300 cubic meters. So we do have surplus. Yeah, what, 1,100 or so. Yeah. I was under the impression that uh, one major reason why diseases have gone down in India was due to ROS water. Mm. This is my impression. I may be wrong. You can answer that. Second is that is RO sustainable? Because we reject a lot. Yeah, 
so coming to the second point, uh, on the first point, we still don't have data, as I was talking about. Uh, we still don't have real data. Uh, but there are regional, for example, there are studies in urban areas. But then that is not really India. Uh, looking at the second question, no, that's not true. yeah. In Karnataka, you know, every village has got RO plants. Yeah, yeah, sure. But what I'm trying to say is the data. See, data based on. Uh, so water RO is not the solution, yes. not only because of uh, this kind of reject, but because I personally feel that all minerals are taken out and you essentially see a little bit of just about 20 or 30 ppm of uh, minerals there. At just to 100, you will essentially have sodium and uh, magnesium and that's all that you have. And you lose about all the molybdenum, all the zinc, we have estimated all that. So. Uh, Minister of Defense is uh, 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 opening up a challenge uh, which will soon go to uh, most of the school, colleges and university students. Yeah. And there, uh, the challenge is on uh, plastics in water. So, they asked uh, us, I should, I think, I will forward their request to you, that what should be the problem statement, if you, for this kind of a challenge, that plastics in water, can you spell out three problem statements, which should be included in this competition? Well, um, probably you don't want to formulate that uh, during this particular <laughs> thing. Uh, yeah, we will discuss that. But there are several such challenges that people have raised. But in the Indian context, yeah. it is the plastics are not really present in our wells or any other places. What plastics are present in the public water bodies. And that is what we need to conserve. It is not only about human beings, but about the entire ecosystem. So that your challenges, I think, should be around public water supply, water systems, water bodies, as well as the entire ecosystem as a whole. If you can probably identify a few plastics in fish, for example, and how do you prevent that will be a very important thing. We have solutions for these, some of these plastic degradation, but we will discuss that. Yeah. Since, there is, uh, since you have proposed a cost-effective uh, technology, to solve the water problems. So why there has to be a uh, water dispute between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu or elsewhere, riparian states? No, that water dispute is not about purification. It, that water dispute is about sharing available water resources. It is about dividing rivers. <coughs> what did you say? Yeah, so Desalination plants will work only near coastal areas. Rest of it is transportation. We, that is not cost effective. There are additional issues. And power issues also. In my abstract, I have discussed that uh, energy cost quite substantially. Just desalination alone, we are using about 70 million kilowatts of energy. So once again, clearly it's, it's a data driven process. Obviously, and for that measurement tools and techniques and big data analytics, all of these is required. Okay. If there are, I don't see any other hands going up. So, please join me in thanking Dr. Pradeepar with wonderful. <laughs>